here's what I would say to millennials on university campuses and in, in the marketplace when you graduate and you're out, and it's this. Um, we, we have a group of people we call our friends, and those are the people that we listen to. And I would say, I would really, really find out what are you listening to? There's three voices in the universe, right? And one of the voices is the internal voice that's made up of what we learn growing up. It's learned of what our friends say to us, what we see on TV. We adapt things that feel right and become a filter within us. When we make choices and decisions in life, it's based on all those opinions of other people, right? Now we have another voice, it's the voice of the enemy. Then we have the voice of God. So there's three voices. What voice do you listen to in life? That's what I would say. What voice? Find out the voices. Who is surrounding you and what are they saying to you and how are they saying it to you? That's what I would say is the most important thing. So my message to Christians are around the world is to just come here to Israel and see what's happening here. To see by their eyes how our life here as Christians and as minorities, other minorities here, uh, are in Israel, how we are going to jobs, how we are mixed together. Like I'm here, uh, I'm living here in a mixed community uh, next to Jews, Christians, Muslims, and we are all here working together in order to make our lives here better. We are working with the community and with, with the Jewish people and with the Christians in order to make our lives better because we are here living next to each other and we need to make the best of it. And I can see that and the others can see that Israel is the only safe place here in, in the Middle East because we are seeing what's happening to minorities and to Christians in the Middle East. We are seeing what's happening with ISIS and what's happening in Lebanon, in, in my beloved country, that I needed to run away from my country because I was chased and I was uh, forced to leave only because I was Christian. And Israel was the only state to, to have me and to accept me, although I'm a Christian. I really want people to come here and see our lives. I really want people to see how great a nation is Israel and how our life are good here. He's one of the best all-around players, in my opinion, in the country. I look for Tamir to be a major, major player in college. We can file, file this next story under the category of whatever happened to. And in this case, the subject is a basketball player from Baltimore who exploded onto the scene when he got the nickname Jewish Jordan. Sports Illustrated dubbed him the Jewish Michael Jordan. Today, Tamir Goodman visits Chicago to show Kempers that he's still got game. I never asked to be called the Jewish Michael Jordan. Um, I feel fortunate that I grew up uh, being able to watch him play and learn from him. Sports is such a universal language. I'm an Orthodox Jew that graduated from a Christian school, roomed with a Muslim basketball player in college, and then I go over to Israel and I play with, with people from all over the world. It's not like Goodman was the first Jewish kid who could play ball, but he was the first to wear his religion on his head. You see, Goodman is Orthodox, which means he always sports a yarmulke. Believe it or not, even in Israel, Goodman was the first Orthodox Jew to play pro basketball. Kids got amazing convictions to be able to pass up potential wow. fame in college basketball for his religion. Got to respect what that. What he Absolutely. believes in. Unbelievable. I prefer to live in Israel and raise my, with my wife and four kids because this is my favorite place on earth. Like every, Jerusalem is my favorite city in the world. Like every single day I wake up, I'm the happiest person because I'm exactly where I want to be. I um, mean, the reason I want to be here is because I love the spiritual energy. I love how you feel God here so much. I know that not that long ago, our entire nation was, was, was try, they tried to wipe us out and that was their goal. And um, just to say that we're here in Israel, back in our homeland, <laughs> is an amazing blessing and I encourage everybody to come see for yourself. There's a day automatically every year in the UN when they automatically, it's tabled, even if no one tables it, six anti-Israel resolutions. All of a sudden, Israel tries to defend itself and, and innocent Palestinians are killed. That's what happens in war. And, and you're, it's an obsession. It's absolute obsession. I mean, I know that the UN, you know, resolutions against Israel in the last five years, there have been 62 resolutions against, against Israel and 59 against the rest of the world combined. That's an obsession. It's, a, it's an obsession. And to single out the best and condemn it as the worst tells us more about those doing the condemning than it does about those who are being condemned.
Terrorism in Israel goes way, way beyond the occupation. There is nothing in Israel to even remotely resemble apartheid. Apartheid is institutionalized racism. It, it's, it's a pop term. All you need is a handful of slogans and close the Bible mm. and, and you can justify about anything. Wow. Especially catastrophic when most of that comes from Western sources, including the United States, whilst the Arab countries, the oil-rich Arab countries, are importing labor from anywhere except their own, but will not do anything to help their own people. It is one of the ugliest aspects and most cynical aspects of Arab policies, and we are collaborating with it by participating in it. And it's a problem which, in effect, the Arabs imposed upon us and used as a dagger against us to maintain the plight of these people. This is the only issue that needs to be dealt with? That UNRWA, the organization that deals with them, receives more money from the UN than all other refugees and issues in the world combined? It just shows how completely distorted everything is in this conflict. Yasser Arafat made a deal with all the presidents to keep the refugees where they at, to use as a, as a winning card when he does his negotiation with the world. And he said, if these people are getting into these countries and become part of these countries, then there's no such thing as a Palestinian issue. And he did more damage to these refugees than Israel did. Is there, other than the, you're saying as a propaganda, I if guess. You, if you're not standing up hill, here on the hill, getting the bird's eye view. Okay. If you're only taken in and then out again, that's all you see. So in general, when we look at the UN's treatment of Israel, the notion that it's an international body and it's going to be fair is absolutely not, is not true. The only way to solve this is through a negotiated peace settlement that is chaperoned, if you like, for lack of another word, by the United Nations because we have the experience, we have the knowledge, and we have the trust and the ability. If you really cared about the world, sitting down with a list of, let's see what are the real great, the 10 greatest human rights problems in the world. I can tr promise you the Israel-Palestinian conflict is not in the top 10. I think there's always a little bit of racism from certain groups, but no, I think there has been fair treatment. And I mean, 20% of the Israeli population is Arabic. And let's say if I take my little brother to the park at night and they'll play, I mean, they might not speak the same language. Mm. They might have a few words in between. Mm -hmm. But you know, we're all brothers. We're all mm. from the same country. Mm -hmm. We're all, we all care about one another. When I try to speak on college campuses against the BDS movement or in favor of Israel, there are often violent reactions. Mm. Uh, people want to keep me from speaking on the campus. Um, sometimes it takes the form of trying to shout me down. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it takes the form of petitions. At Johns Hopkins, students painted a Hitler mustache on a poster advertising my talk on my, on my face. There's a balance that has to be struck between legitimate protest and trying to stop mm. free speech on campus. So what's going on in the Palestinian, Palestinian Authority is that they're given money by, by foreign aid, and instead of actually doing things, they decide, oh, we're gonna continue this conflict, we're gonna incite violence, we're gonna keep it going, and we're just gonna get rich. But why don't they just stand up and say, we declare independence, this is our state. It's because they don't want a state. What, why do you think he would turn down such a... Because he didn't want peace. Okay. He had an agenda, he wants you dead. He was uh, the Hitler of his uh, group there. He give, he, the only reason he, had more, he didn't have more blood on his hands because he didn't have the opportunity to kill people. Mm. If he had the opportunity, he would have wiped them all out. The, to the kind of missile technology that we now have in southern Lebanon, nearly 100,000 missiles facing us from the Hezbollah and from the Gaza Strip, they, they re, their missile arsenal as well, would see Israel surrounded by missiles and unable to protect herself. No strategic depth, no way to exist, no way to survive the obliteration of Israel in a very short time. That's where that would lead to. And the world knows this. No matter how many compromises and how much land they give back, and they're left with practically nothing in a sea of huge territory that the Arabs have, they still can't accept the state of Israel. It's as if you have two kitchens and a toilet, and they have three countries, and they still can't tolerate the fact that you have two kitchens and a toilet. And if we only stopped making that extra toilet, we would have peace. Well, the toilet, I can understand, but two kitchens, that's going too far. Israel is singled out. And Israel is a unique country. It's like an oasis here in a sea of barbarism. And we are being kind of isolated by people who claim to be concerned about human rights. These people are turning towards Israel and ignoring the mayhem and the millions of people who have been displaced and killed around them 
and concentrating on the Jews. This, to me, is quite open anti-Semitism. Relegating Israel to prior state status so that the world will squeeze Israel out of, into its mold, into what it wants Israel to be. That there is no rational basis for singling out Israel. And so you have to ask yourself, why are so many people acting irrationally? And that's a question more for psychiatrists than for political analysts. The goal of the BDS movement, it's to undermine the Jewish state, to weaken the Jewish state to the point that it will no longer exist, either demographically, financially, militarily, whatever it takes. There's, there's a hatred for Israel that exists. The church Christians don't see what God is doing. They see a political uh, entity because God has a side. And his side is not prejudicial against anybody. He loves all mankind. He has a wonderful plan for the Arab world, and he will bring that plan about through Israel. And so those who are standing purportedly with the Arabs, hearts overflowing with compassion for the poor underdogs of the Middle East, as they are portrayed as, which, by the way, is a misrepresentation. And in a sense, we're really telling God, you know what, you're actually harsh against the Arabs, and we're going to take their side. And that puts, us, that puts us against God himself. The problem is that passivity uh, is taking a form in the church, and this is pathetic. Yes. And sadly, <coughs> prophetic of America's downfall. I don't feel afraid, really. I have many Muslims and uh, Arabs here against me. And they must to, to, to close my, uh, to, silence to silence me. I speak well the, what the Bible say. I'm not speak uh, political and anything. I speak what the Bible say. So the more that I reuse the yeah. water that I have, the more that I make sure I do not lose the water in the pipes right. that I already made, I am making less energy, mm -hmm. I am making less CO2 emissions. Is there any unique uh, technology uh, in well, the Well, we've been doing, there's a lot of uh, fascinating companies coming out. I just read, uh, heard about recently about a company that takes water out of the air in Israel and does that. It's very technical things such as agriculture or water technology or the knowledge and trauma that we bring. All these things are, of course, very important and these are direct skills that we can export and that as a country that's part of this world and that wants to be part of this world, we have a certain duty. And if they take away uh, a part of the scientific community, yeah. they're taking away a lot of, um, they're literally it's more than the individual scientists they're knocking yes. out. They're really setting things back. I don't think we can afford to lose what's happening here. It's to humanity in general, frankly. Uh, to my opinion, it's, it smells a little bit anti-Semitic. Uh, a little bit, okay? I, 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 and I'm trying to be very politically correct. Yes. I, I tell Jews all the time, Christians are our best friends. Mm. It's a fact. Uh, people know this to be a fact now. So many Christians are so much closer to me than my own Jewish people. Why is that? Because you, you got Jewish people who are just by name Jewish, but that's it. They're building self-driving cars. A company called U-Move, what they do is take any, any smartphone, any mobile phone, and they track your eyes. So what they did originally with that was, you know, for gaming and for other things, what they're doing right now is they're looking at the medical space. and They're saying for, for decades, Doctors used eye tracking to diagnose Parkinson's and you know, ADD and other things using hardware, using a helmet. But now you can do it on any phone. So they track your eyes on a mobile phone. It's, it's phenomenal. We, we're using a particle accelerator which has been converted into a free electron laser. Mm. And we're using it as a very wide band source of um, lasing radiation. Mm -hmm. At the moment, we're running tests on lung cancer oh. and uh, remote power beaming. Certain frequencies have very strong interaction, which mm. means it's possible yeah. to kill off certain cells or switch on and switch off certain processes. Yeah. And we're able to generate, we're able to really finely tune what frequency we produce in a way that most other systems can't. The platform that was developed here in Israel and the carrier that can bring us specifically to the cancer cells. It's very clear the stated goals of the Palestinian leadership on campuses in P Palestine around the world is to undermine Israel, its ability to defend itself, its ability to provide for itself and to exist. It's a clearly defined goal. The question that Christians 
Christians need to be asking themselves, and it's a very, very sobering question given the time we're living in, is not whether God takes one side or the other, but whether we are on God's side. And so those who are standing purportedly with the Arabs, hearts overflowing with compassion for the poor underdogs of the Middle East, as they are portrayed as, and in a sense we're really telling God, you know what, you're actually harsh against the Arabs, and we're going to take their side. And that puts us, that puts us against God himself. Where does it end? Okay, so I come along and say, well, it didn't really mean Jesus. It really meant, and then you fill in, your, your son of God or your prophet. It didn't, oh, it doesn't really mean Jesus. Now, Mormons don't say this, but let's say Mormons said, no, it really means Joseph Smith. Huh? Yeah. By the way, Mormons don't say no, that. I just want to make no, that clear, I, but yeah. I'm just trying to give no. some right. e example of what Oh, it doesn't really mean Israel. Right. That's where Jews get annoyed. That, that uh, I, I think my own theology is that Christianity, when done right, is a divine vehicle to bring the world to the God of Mount Sinai, the God of Abraham, the God of Israel, the God of the Torah, and to the Torah. Mm. There are more Christians who believe in the divinity of the Torah than Jews. Um, we work in South Sudan dealing with you know, the independence of the country and trying to help build that country mm -hmm. using all the knowledge we have from having built one here. Um, we're working in Uganda and Kenya with impoverished populations and refugees. And we've had people that have walked up and gone, you would? Yeah. You would? Yeah. You, like you're, and they're, they're shocked. Or, but they see that the, the shock is more about you're, you're acting differently than they, they had stereotyped you or they just didn't know Jews were out doing this type of work. Oh no, it's a stereotype for sure. It definitely is that this is not what they were expecting mm -hmm. and this is not what they would expect from a Jew. Mm -hmm.